at Kent State University, Kent, Ohio. We are a nonprofit training and outreach organization at uh, Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. Today we have Judy Kornfeld, president of ESOP Economics. Our session today is repurchase obligations, moving from study to strategy. And I really like Judy's approach to this critical issue for all ESOP companies. Um, she puts repurchase liability planning into the strategic process. So Judy, take it away. Thank you, Jay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking today about my favorite topic, repurchase obligations. I'm a repurchase obligation consultant, and I spend um, virtually all of my professional time thinking about these issues. Um, so we'll start first by just talking about why repurchase obligations are so important right now. Um, and there are really two factors that have converged over the last few years to make ESOP repurchase obligations larger than they ever were historically. Um, the first, of course, is the prevalence of 100% ESOP ownership, the change in the tax laws allowing S corporations uh, to <clears throat> have an ESOP as a shareholder certainly led uh, to an increase in the number of 100% ESOPs. Um, and the larger the ownership by the ESOP, the larger the repurchase obligations. The other factor that is uh, contributing right now is the fact that the baby boomers are beginning to move into retirement. The first edge of the baby boomers turned 65 last year. And um, we're seeing uh, that the management group in many ESOP companies is approaching retirement age. And over the next five to 10 years, there will be significant repurchase obligations as a result of that. The other thing that's happening is that ESOP appraisers have begun to recognize that repurchase obligations are going to put a significant demand on cash flow in many ESOP companies. And so they're beginning to ask for projections. They're telling their clients that they need to provide a projection of repurchase obligations so that the appraiser can factor that in to the valuation. Now, whether it will actually affect value or not is another question. Um, but it, the, the appraisers are beginning to say, we need to know what this looks like so that we can treat it appropriately in the valuation. And finally, the boards of directors of ESOP companies are beginning to recognize that as part of their fiduciary obligation as the uh, board, they need to understand and plan for these obligations. The repurchase obligation is the responsibility of the company, not the trust. So um, the boards of directors are beginning to say we need to pay attention to this. The big questions that companies are asking is, how big are the repurchase obligations going to be, and when are they going to hit us? Um, can we afford them without hampering our growth? Can, will we still have enough money to uh, acquire other companies or uh, make capital expenditures and do the things that we need to do to grow our business? And then finally, what's the best way to manage and fund them? We're going to talk about how you address these questions today. <clears throat> uh, it, in a lot of companies, historically, repurchase obligations have been dealt with in a rather piecemeal way um, each year uh, with uh, the CFO doing some analysis and trying to tackle the question of how much should be contributed to the ESOP this year? Should we redeem some shares? Or should we do, be doing any re-leveraging? And um, it consumes a lot of time uh, when you try to go through that process every year without some overriding plan or framework for it. Um, and what happens when you don't have a, a long-term plan is that the decisions you tend to make about how you're going to deal with the repurchase obligations tend to be influenced more by short-term considerations rather than the long-term goals that you've established for your ESOP and your company. So the alternative to that kind of piecemeal decision-making is to uh, go through a comprehensive planning process uh, to develop a repurchase obligation strategy that's based on a thorough analysis of your situation and of the alternatives that are available to you. Uh, 
that meets the long-term goals that you've established for the company and the ESOP. Um, and that plan can be reviewed regularly to make sure that it is still effective and still accomplishing what you need and fine-tuned as needed. Um, so it's not something that you, a, a long-term plan that you establish and um, uh, and then you're done. You have to keep revisiting it, looking at it, making sure that the underlying considerations are still valid. Um, I see there's a question um, from uh, one of the participants about whether this PowerPoint presentation will be available after the presentation. And uh, yes, a set of slides will be available. Um, so, how do you develop a plan uh, for repurchase obligations? You really need an understanding of two basic things. The first is, how will your repurchase obligations affect your cash flow, your income, and your stock value? Um, and Often tra you know, traditional repurchase obligation studies, um, we don't have polling set up, but I don't know how many of you have had a repurchase obligation study done. But uh, often repurchase obligation studies are based on some straight line assumption about what's going to happen to the value of the stock. And a, a, a projection is prepared that uh, based on actuarial and plan provisions um, and an assumed stock value. Um, and you know, historically, that, that's how most studies were done. Um, the unfortunate thing about that is it doesn't really put the repurchase obligations in context. Um, so you can't really tell when you look at those results whether you're going to have enough money to meet those repurchase obligations and how different strategies might affect the share value or your cash flow. Um, this, so it's, it's really important um, in developing a plan uh, to, to understand how it affects the company, how, how the repurchase obligations affect the company. Um, the second thing that you need to understand is um, the tools that are available to you to manage and fund repurchase obligations, and what combination of those tools is going to best meet your company's goals. Um, and then the complexity uh, of this kind of planning arises from the fact that the choice of repurchase obligation tools, uh, which we'll, go, we'll discuss in a, a few minutes the, the, what tools are available, but that choice of tools in turn may affect the cash flow, earnings, and share value. Um, and so you have an iterative analysis that has to take place. And what we're going to talk about today is a process for doing this. Um, you can do it. It's a little complicated. Um, but uh, it can be done. So let me give you a quick overview of the process. And then we're going to drill down and talk about each of these steps in more detail. Uh, the first step in, in this kind of planning is to define your objectives and your parameters, you know, what's important to your company. Next is your constraints, uh, identifying what the constraints are within which you have to operate. Third step is to develop a model. Fourth step is to identify, uh, based on the modeling, the, uh, it, what the issues and challenges that your company will face uh, are going to be then analyzing alternatives um, and identifying a potential strategy. After that, you test that strategy. Then you implement. And then finally, you revisit and update periodically. So now we're going to begin drilling down uh, and, and looking at each of these parts of the process in a little more detail. The first step is defining your objectives and parameters. What's important to your company? Um, are you concerned about um, sustainability of the ESOP? Are you, do you care about a flow of shares for new participants? Uh, what about target benefit levels for your company? Uh, share value growth, um, avoiding haves and have-nots, uh, having a particular type of distribution policy or something else. And so you need to do some self-examination on this and internal discussion uh, at 
the top management level and perhaps the ESOP committee level to talk about what the goals are. What does your company care about with respect to the ESOP and what are you trying to accomplish with the ESOP? The next uh, step is to identify the constraints within which you are operating. Um, and some of these things might be cash flow, bank covenants, conflicting business needs, um, in, you know, reinvestment in the business, uh, or things like that. The level of ESOP ownership that you want to sustain. Um, whether you have S distributions that have to be made if you are less than 100% uh, ESOP owned S corporations, perhaps you um, will have to continue to make S distributions. Um, and, and what are your ESOP plan provisions? And while there's flexibility to amend plan provisions, uh, some of those can only be amended prospectively. So um, <clears throat> you have to really understand what the constraints are uh, that you are facing. The next step is to develop a model. Um, and this is, uh, you know, candidly, this is a complicated um, process and one that is a little bit time consuming. Uh, we do a lot of this kind of modeling and we can, I can tell you it, is, uh, it, it isn't a very simple thing to do. Um, many companies do this kind of modeling on their own. Um, others uh, look, look to advisors for it. Um, but the model needs to integrate three components. The first is financial projections. That would include the P&L, or income statement, the balance sheet, and a cash flow statement. And typically the starting point for that kind of modeling is uh, the projections that you prepare for your appraiser. Uh, and that you prepare for your own internal um, business planning. Um, and then you, you have to carry it out because the repurchase obligation planning is long-term planning. Um, the second component of the model are valuation metrics. And uh, you need to reflect in, in the model how the, re how the stock value will change over time based on the P&L balance sheet and cash flow. And typically what you would do here is mimic the methodology that your appraiser is using. <coughs> Excuse me, I seem to uh, have a little hoarseness here. Um, so the, so uh, when, when you build out the model, you're going to build a long-term model. We usually go out 20 years. Um, we, we tend to look at 15 to 20 years for the planning horizon. Well, let's say 10 to 15 years for the planning horizon, but we carry the projections out a bit further. Um, and, and then uh, you're, you're carrying the valuation out as well. Um, the, so you have an income statement, a balance sheet, a cash flow statement. And then from that you derive a projected share value. Um, and uh, unlike the appraisal that's done annually for the company, you're going to need to carry the share value out into the future. And that's, um, that's one of the challenging parts of this. Um, the third piece of the model are the repurchase obligation projections. And those actually uh, need to be done in the way a traditional study is done, taking into account all of the actuarial factors the, and the plan provisions, you know, eligibility, investing, retirement age, and distribution rules. Um, but the, it needs to be integrated. Those projections need to be integrated into the financial projections so that the effect that the repurchase obligations have on cash flow uh, and on the balance sheet um, can be reflected and then in turn that carries through to the valuation, the projected share value. So that integrated model allows you to understand the effect that repurchase obligations will have on cash flow and earnings and on share value and it allows you to examine the effect of alternative strategies. And it also allows you to answer the question of will we have enough money for this? Um, of course, based on assumptions. Um, <clears throat> and um, that is the key to this kind of planning, is having that context and having a way to really examine the implications of alternative strategies. <clears throat> 
Um, initially, when you create the model, uh, you, you typically do uh, it based on your best guess projection. Um, and that's usually what you're giving your appraiser as well. Uh, and, but there is some stress testing that should be done as well, and that comes a little later in the process. Any questions so far? Okay, I will continue. Um, I'm, I have three slides now that are just examples of what the model looks like. I don't think you can read them, and that's sort of intentional. I don't really have, I don't, you don't really need to see the numbers so much as you need to see that we have an integrated um, model. It's a, an Excel workbook, and it has the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow, uh, and then a valuation component. And that, that's what you're trying to achieve here. And then the repurchase projections are also uh, part of this, this model. And I'm just going to quickly uh, go through the slides. Um, in, in the model, these uh, sheets are actually um, integrated. So the formulas are interconnected. Um, and that is um, you know what uh, that's what needs to happen in order to make the model work. Um, so another important part of the model um, is uh, is the the valuation component and and to to do the valuation projection part of the model, you need to understand how your appraiser is treating repurchase obligations in the valuation. And historically, um, many appraisers normalized ESOP expenses in the valuation. In other words, you give the, the appraiser your projections for what your uh, cash flow is going to be and what your ESOP contributions are going to be. And the appraiser might very well adjust the ESOP contribution to a normalized level of benefits. Um, that, that, that particular thing has been evolving over the past several years. Uh, the valuation community and the valuation advisory committee of the ESOP Association in particular have been looking at this issue. Um, and they have actually written two issue briefs. Uh, number 25 and number 27, if you're members of the ESOP Association, you can um, get copies of those. But um, n those issue briefs suggest that repurchase obligations need to be considered in the valuation. Um, but they don't provide a lot of guidance about exactly how they should be factored in. And so not all appraisers are doing the same things, and there is not really any consensus yet in the valuation community about how repurchase obligations should be reflected in the share value. So when you're trying to forecast repurchase obligations and build this kind of model, you need to understand how your appraiser is valuing your company's stock um, and how, um, how they're reflecting the repurchase obligations in. Um, and the valuation component of the model should be consistent with the appraiser's methodology. So, um, so far we've, we've looked at the um, first couple of steps here, um, identifying your goals and your constraints and building a model. The next step is to identify the particular issues and challenges that you're facing. And, and the way you do that is you model a base case, your best guess case, and you see what's going on. You figure out what the issues are. Um, are there going to be cash flow issues? Uh, how do the benefit levels that would be required to sustain the ESOP on a, a straight contribution basis compare with your uh, benefit uh, targets? And um, are you going to be creating, um, are you going to run out of shares and be creating a have and have not problem? Um, are you going to face uh, repurchase obligations that vary significantly from year to year uh, or are lumpy, <laughs> uh, as I like to say. Um, lumpy repurchase obligations are a big issue 
in smaller ESOP companies. And by smaller, I mean less than several hundred participants because each person represents a larger percentage of the ESOP. And this is especially true in ESOPs with fewer than 100 participants. Each person represents a fairly large percentage of the ESOP. And so the timing of individual events will create a lot of variability. And we're particularly seeing that now um, as uh, this first wave of baby boomers is approaching retirement. We're seeing um, that many companies will face a period of abnormally high repurchase obligations. Um, some other things that, uh, another thing that may be a factor is your stock value. If, um, if the benefits are being normalized and your stock value is, uh, is growing more rapidly um, than cash flow, uh, it, it can be an issue. Or there may be other things that you identify. So you need to understand what your challenges are, what kinds of particular problems um, are you going to need to solve in order to uh, deal with repurchase obligations. So the, the next step in this process uh, after you've identified what the challenges are is to analyze the alternative that you have available to you. There are a certain number of tools that are available for repurchase obligations. Unfortunately, we have no silver bullets for this. Um, you have some basic uh, things that you can do with your distribution policy. Uh, and that includes the timing of distributions. Are you going to pay people out immediately or make them wait? Are you going to pay them in a lump sum or in installments? Um, are you going to uh, segregate accounts as people leave the ESOP? In other words, convert company stock to cash? Uh, or are you going to do rebalancing uh, where everybody will end up with the same proportion of cash and uh, stock in, in their accounts? Um, and so um, you, know, you have certain tools that you can use to manage the repurchase obligations with your distribution policy. I will suggest to you that the distribution policy and the funding strategy need to be coordinated. For example, um, if you are going to use S distributions as part of your funding strategy and you want to make people wait for distributions, um, and you know, wait five years and then be paid out over five years, those terminated participants, because they still have stock in their accounts, will receive some of the S distributions. So uh, you need the, the distribution policy and the funding methods need to be coordinated. Um, Judy? Yes? This is Jay. This distribution policy, which often has a huge impact on, on repurchase, uh, if, a, if an ESOP company discovers that the distribution policy uh, needs to be adjusted, uh, that can be done under certain circumstances. Is that right? That's right. Um, there are some limits. Generally, one can change from lump sum to installments. And um, perhaps um, also change uh, the timing, whether you make people wait or not. There is a little bit of disagreement in, in among ESOP attorneys about that because the regulations and the Internal Revenue Code are a little in conflict there. But most, um, most advisors think that you can change both the timing and the form of the distribution. That would be a, a place where your, um, your legal counsel would have to be called into the mix. Absolutely. Um, so uh, yeah, you have flexibility there on segregating. Um, it certainly needs to be in your plan document if you want to do that, and you would um, you might need to amend the plan document to provide for that. Um, and then um, I don't believe that's a protected benefit, so you can change that. Um, the same with rebalancing. So. Uh, but again, anything related to distribution policy or plan for provisions needs to um, be discussed with your ESOP attorney. And nothing I say today should be construed as tax or legal advice. Um, 
So um, let's talk about the funding methods very uh, quickly here, and then we'll, we'll dive in a little deeper on that. Each of the funding methods has, has different consequences. And um, there are really only four things, and they're usually best used in combination. Those are contributions, redemptions, S distributions or dividends, and loans or releveraging. And so I'm, I'm going to spend some time uh, just going through those in a little bit more detail. Um, the first would be contributions. And contributions are the basic building block of your repurchase obligation funding strategy. Uh, in almost every instance, um, contributions will be the main component or a very significant component of uh, the strategy that you put in place. Uh, the way it works, the way contributions work, of course, is that the company contributes cash to the ESOP, and uh, to the extent that there's that that provides cash to the plan, the repurchases are handled within the ESOP, and the shares are reallocated to active participants. Um, and uh, this, the thing to remember about contributions as compared to some other things is that they are allocated pro rata to compensation, and they only go to active participants. Um, so the consequences uh, on your cash flow and your earnings is that contributions reduce your operating income, your EBITDA, and your cash. And so the higher the contribution, theoretically, the lower the value should be unless the appraiser is normalizing the contribution. Um, and so uh, that may affect the equity value of the company and the value per share. Um, and to the extent that it does affect those, those things, it may affect any other equity compensation plans that you have and profit sharing based plans. So um, you know, managing the contribution level uh, and the effect that it has on your earnings uh, is important in terms of how it might affect other things. Um, the other thing about it, since, since contributions are allocated pro rata to compensation, um, they don't affect participants uh, disproportionately based on stock balances in their accounts. Um, and as we'll see, some other funding methods may do that. Next method is redemptions. Um, and I, I, you will often hear discussions about redeeming versus recycling shares. Um, you know, redemptions um, are a useful tool but have some consequences that you may really not like. Um, the way redemptions work is that the shares uh, are distributed from the ESOP and repurchased by the company. So when you have repurchase obligations um, instead of repurchasing the shares within the ESOP, the shares would be repurchased by the company. And when that happens, they're typically retired, uh, reducing the number of shares outstanding. Although you can redeem shares and then contribute them back to the ESOP or, or re-leverage. And we can talk about that, that uh, as part of re-leveraging. Um, when you when you redeem stock, it doesn't affect your operating income or your net income or your EBITDA. It is not part of those calculations, but it does use cash. Um, it also reduces the number of shares outstanding, and it doesn't add re redemptions. Don't add shares to participant accounts. So, a couple of things happen as a result. As a result of the reduction in the number of shares outstanding you will tend to have, over time, uh, a share value that grows faster than your aggregate equity value. And um, many ESOP companies have uh, decided that they don't like that outcome because it gives a message to participants that is inconsistent with the actual financial performance of the company. Most participants focus on the value per share that they see on their statement. Uh, on their ESOP statement. And if that value per share is growing faster um, than the actual value of the company because the number of shares outstanding is declining, it's hard to connect the participant, uh, the employee behavior and performance with the financial performance. So having share value growing faster than aggregate, aggregate equity value may be undesirable. Um, 
The other thing about redemptions is because they drive up the value per share faster than equity value, it tends to favor the participants uh, who have the largest account balances. And that can create um, some potential have and have not problems. Um, uh, not only because the share value is growing faster, but because redemptions don't add any shares to the participant accounts. Uh, and as you concentrate the value in, uh, in, in the larger accounts, it also will make repurchase obligations lumpier. So there are some things about redemptions that are um, potentially problematic. Um, and many, um, the advice that was um, offered in the Valuation Advisory Committee's first issue brief uh, was, was that um, companies should decide on a target contribution level that's consistent with the level of benefits they would like to offer and then handle any repurchase obligations over and above that through redemptions. Um, but you know, unfortunately, redemptions have these consequences uh, that need to be understood, and there are some alternatives. Um, and a, a, one of the alternatives is to, if you're an S corporation, to make S distributions. If you're not an S corporation, you could make, you could pay dividends. Um, and the way the S dis distributions work is that the company pays earnings distributions uh, to shareholders. That, of course, to the extent the ESOP is a shareholder, the ESOP receives cash, and that cash can be used to repurchase shares. Um, like redemptions, S distributions do not affect your operating income uh, or your net income or your EBITDA, but they do use cash. So they're just like redemptions in that regard. Um, and they also will affect aggregate equity value because cash is leaving the company. Um, and that will affect value per share. But um, since you're not reducing the number of shares outstanding, equity, aggregate equity value and value per share will grow at the same rate. So you will avoid that uh, issue of having disparate growth rates. Um, like redemptions, they, the S distributions will favor participants with the larger account balances because the S distributions are allocated pro rata to shares. They're paid, their dividends paid on the shares. So uh, people with larger account balances get more S distributions. And that can tend to exacerbate um, have and have not problems. Um, but uh, it, it, S distributions also won't put any shares uh, in the, uh, won't put anything into the accounts of people who don't already have stock since they're allocated pro rata uh, to stock balances. So for a participant who doesn't have much of a share balance, uh, S distributions will provide very little benefit. The fourth of the tools, uh, and the last one that we'll discuss, is re-leveraging. Um, re-leveraging is um, re-leveraging can be done a number of different ways, um, but uh, basically, as a repurchase obligation funding tool, uh, the way it would work is that um, the shares uh, that have to be repurchased would be distributed, uh, the company would buy them back and then sell them back to the ESOP with a loan. Um, at initiation, and when you initiate these loans, it doesn't affect your operating income or EBITDA, uh, but it uses cash or you might incur some external debt uh, to fund an internal loan to the ESOP. So, um, so there will be a use of cash um, that will affect, may affect value. Um, and it, it, what re-leveraging does is it pushes shares into loan suspense. Instead of shares being repurchased and allocated, reallocated immediately, they would be repurchased and put into loan suspense and released as the loan is repaid over time. Um, so um, the, and re, there are some complexities to re-leveraging. Um, we're not going to discuss in detail today. Um, and certainly if part of your strategy is re-leveraging, you will need to work with your advisors to deal with all of the operational complexities of re-leveraging. What re-leveraging um, does is it reduces participant account balances because shares are in loan suspense. Uh, 
um, instead of reallocated. And they're still outstanding, so they're not driving the share value up as redemptions do. Um, so um, your repurchase obligations are lower because account balances are lower. Um, the problem is that uh, you will then need to use a portion of your future ESOP contributions uh, to make the loan payments. And so uh, releveraging, you, you can't overuse releveraging or you, you get into an unsustainable situation. So the, the, the challenge with repurchase obligation funding strategy is figuring out what's the right combination of tools. Uh, you know, to what extent should you use contributions um, and you know, we see often that the contribution level, the benefit level that companies would like to make to the ESOP isn't enough um, to fully cover repurchase obligations. And so it, it may be necessary or desirable uh, to have a slightly higher contribution level than you'd like or to supplement the contribution level with S distributions or redemptions or releveraging. So the, the, the challenge with the planning and the, the purpose of the model is to help you figure out what combination is going to be the right combination for your company given your goals and constraints. And some of the considerations uh, that enter into that decision are the effect on income, um, on aggregate equity value and share value, benefit levels, and you have, you know, you have um, competitive hiring considerations, or you know, able to attract people to your company, uh, or you know, or and you also have, so you want to have a benefit level that's high enough. Um, not a problem in most ESOP companies. Contribution levels tend to be higher than uh, what other companies contribute to their retirement plans. But you also don't want to necessarily be shifting value. Uh, from the shareholders to the employees by having contributions and benefit levels that are too high. Um, so there's a balancing act there. Um, some other considerations are long-term sustainability of the strategy and of the ESOP versus short-term advantages of a particular strategy. And, and this is why the long-term planning is useful because otherwise you, you tend to keep making a series of short-term decisions that may not get you where you want to be long term. And then the final consideration is complexity. And um, sometimes the combination of funding strategies um, makes things a little bit more complicated in terms of the annual uh, administration and funding of the ESOP. Um, but um, we'll talk about uh, that in a minute. Uh, and things like releveraging uh, can be quite complicated. So complexity is a consideration. How willing are you to um, to put complex things in place. The next, um, next step in the process is uh, to test against your goals and constraints. And um, the, you know, the, you, you're going to look at different combinations, different contribution levels, perhaps combined with redemptions or S distributions or other things, you need to test each combination against your goals and, and your parameters and figure out how well it meets them and whether it's sustainable uh, for you over the long term. And then you choose the strategy that best meets your parameters. And that's going to be different for every company. Um, next, uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, uh, worked with a company recently where we did a lot of modeling. The company um, had a stated goal of uh, contributions at the level of 12% of covered payroll. Um, and in the modeling, we discovered that that was not really sustainable um, because their repurchase obligations were going to be much higher than that um, because the value of the company was pretty high relative to the covered payroll of these participants. So um, through uh, looking at a number of combinations, ultimately the company determined that it needed to contribute 18% uh, to the ESOP and supplement that with S distributions. They didn't like the effect of redemptions. Um, and so they decided that S distributions were a better choice for them for funding. And they actually uh, decided that a particular percentage of net income 
was the way that they would determine their um, S distributions. Um, and then in a, a, some periods when repurchase obligations were going to be especially high, they would re-leverage. Um, and so um, they ended up with a combination of three, using three of the tools, uh, and um, looked at many different levels of contributions and S distributions uh, before they arrived at the one that they chose. Um, so uh, you know, the, co it, the, the challenge is, is, is some of this, um, the what ifs and looking at these alternatives. Then you need to stress test. When you've, when you've arrived at the particular combination that you think will be best for your company, then you need to stress test that strategy. How well does it hold up in better uh, forecasts and worst case scenarios? Uh, and you want to make sure that it doesn't break, <laughs> that you have a fairly broad range within which the strategy is robust. Uh, and then um, you want to review the strategy with your ESOP advisors and make sure that there aren't any issues with what you're trying to do. You need to understand if there are any uh, issues or problems based on your plan document or anything else related uh, to your situation. Uh, finally, uh, you will implement the strategy. And uh, there are a few steps in that process. First, uh, you may need, if you need to amend your plan document and your distribution policy, you would go ahead and do that. As uh, we mentioned earlier, there are, there are some limitations on what you can amend in a plan document, um, but generally your distribution policy is flexible. Um, and uh, within certain boundaries can be amended. Um, You're then going to need an annual process for administering the strategy. Uh, for example, in the situation I described where the company had decided upon a particular contribution level and uh, a particular income level, they needed to um, make sure they had a process in place so that the contributions went in early enough to handle diversification, and then the balance of, of uh, the funding came in later in the year. And um, they needed to have um, a process for re-leveraging in place as well because they were going to need updated um, valuations. That one of the complexities of, of re-leveraging is that you need uh, a bring down valuation um, because it's a, an ESOP transaction. And so you, you need to get the annual administration steps in place. Uh, you also need to define any criteria that, uh, for the decisions that you might need to make annually. Uh, again, in the example I gave you, you know, what's the criterion for S distributions? How big is the S distribution going to be? Um, and they define that as a certain percentage of net income. So um, you know, that they know what the S distribution needs to be when they know what their net income is. And then finally, you need to create templates for any documents um, that you're going to use and for the processes uh, that are, are going to be put in place that are going to be implemented year, you know, year after year so that you, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You have a, a procedure that's been documented. Finally, uh, the last step in the process is that you need to review this strategy annually. Um, have there been any significant changes in, uh, in, in the circumstances of the company or in the assumptions that you used? Um, and the Board of Directors agenda should actually include a review of the repurchase obligation strategy each year um, and in one of its meetings. It's part of the annual cycle for the Board. Uh, I think this is really important. I mean, the repurchase obligations uh, are, are a Board level decision. And so um, the, it's a Board level responsibility, and so the Board needs to make sure that it's paying attention to it. So if you have a strategy in place, and each year at one of your board meetings you can say, here's where we are, um, the strategy still looks good, or we need to tweak it this way or that way, um, you know, that will make sure that the board is actually meeting its obligations as well. <laughs>
And finally, uh, you need to revise and update the strategy if it needs to be revised and updated. It needs to change and move as the business um, changes. Okay, so just to recap this process, uh, you start by defining your objectives and parameters. Then you identify your constraints. You develop a model. You identify the particular issues and challenges that you'll face. Uh, you analyze alternative uh, combinations of distribution policies and funding alternatives to see what works best for you. Uh, you then uh, test that, uh, stress test the strategy that you think is the right one for you. Um, you implement, um, and you revisit and update it periodically, probably annually. So in closing, um, developing a long-term repurchase obligation strategy is going to help you understand your challenges and the potential solutions that are available to you. And it's going to help you make decisions that are consistent with your goals and your constraints. Um, the process requires some complex analysis uh, and modeling. Uh, but by using a disciplined process, you can develop and implement a sound, sustainable strategy. And with uh, that, um, I would like to open this up to questions. Yeah, Judy, uh, that was great stuff. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of important concepts in a short period of time, and uh, repurchase obligation topic itself can be very complicated. I like your approach to, to elevating the repurchase obligation issue to the, the corporate strategy uh, planning. Um, and often I, th I think that isn't done. I have a couple things, and, and I'd like to open up the lines as well, but anybody can use that chat box in, in the meantime. Um, I liked your slides, uh, I believe there were 18 through 21, where you talked about the four tools that you suggest that could be used. And I think it deserves repeating that those tools can be used in combination, and those tools should be re reanalyzed uh, periodically and perhaps changed. Um, the first tool, the contributions and the redemption um, discussion that you had, uh, I think especially can be used in combination very effectively and probably often isn't. But uh, in fact, the ESOP company that I was associated with did use that. Could you talk about how these tools can be used in combination? Yes, I'll, I'll be happy to. Um, in my mind, the contribution level is the basic building block. And deciding on a contribution level that makes sense for the company um, is, is the first step in putting together the combination. Uh, for example, um, you, know, you want to make sure you have a, a benefit level that is competitive in your hiring marketplace. Uh, and you also want to make sure that you're not contributing so much to the ESOP that you're impairing the value of the company, since contributions do affect income. You also may have to worry about bank covenants, or in the case of government contractors, uh, reimbursement levels and things like that. So there are a number of things that will contribute to the decision about the contribution level. Um, and to the extent that repurchase obligations are greater than the contribution level that you consider ideal, that's where the other tools come in. Um, in uh, my feeling uh, is that redemptions are, um, I mean, conceptually they're fine. And from a corporate finance uh, standpoint, conceptually, they make sense and they're perfectly logical. But I find that in ESOP situations, um, the redemptions um, are less desirable because they cause share value to rise faster than the overall value of the company. And so that creates uh, potentially a mixed message. However, if, um, if you have uh, uh, small amounts of redemptions, or if they vary and in, in you, you then later contribute some shares, you may be able to even that out. And um, it can be uh, redemptions um, combined with contributions can, can work fine. Um, the other possibility is after you have figured out what your contribution level should be, 
is to use S Distributions if you're 100% ESOP owned. S Corporation, or not 100%, uh, but to use S distributions for that shortfall funding, the amount over and above the contribution level that's needed. So um, th those, those are the two basic ways that Great. I see that you can combine them. Great. Uh, the, and the other uh, comment or question I had is kind of related to, to this. In, and we have. Um, three HR specialists on the call today, so I think it's appropriate. You mentioned that these changes and the, the use of these tools, which may result in a change to your plan, could have uh, uh, HR implications. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the benefit structure may be changed, or even the plan may be changed, where there could be a perception among the participants that there's a, quote, unfairness, okay? And um, so I, I think from an HR perspective, we have to be careful of the, of the culture implications on, on, on taking one of these strategies. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I think um, particularly with respect to distribution policy, I think th there are some um, pushes and pulls in, in the way companies feel about ESOP distributions. On the one hand, um, most companies really prefer not to have terminated participants in the plan. They don't want uh, people who have left the company uh, to continue to have stock and to benefit or suffer from changes in the value of that stock. Usually it's we don't want people to benefit from increases in the value of the stock after they have left the company. So, uh, and, and so a lot of companies um, do one of two things. Um, uh, and they, they, they will either have a lump sum, immediate lump sum distribution policy, uh, or they will uh, cash people out of company stock gradually, uh, or either immediately or gradually over a period of time, um, so uh, without necessarily distributing the account balances right away. So they'll maintain delays in installments. Um, I, th I think the cultural aspect uh, it really has to you know that drives this desire to have immediate lump sum distributions. Um, this you know desire not to have terminated participants still uh, benefiting from share ownership. So, um, so, so that's one aspect. Um, the other thing is uh, the benefit levels in general. And um, the studies that have been done have pretty consistently shown that ESOP companies tend to provide a higher level of benefits uh, than their non-ESOP counterparts. The problem is that many participants, many employees, uh, particularly younger employees, uh, don't value ESOP contributions as highly as they value 401k benefits because of the inability to access the ESOP account compared to the relative access accessibility of the 401k. So, and the ability to control the 401k and the diversification of the 401k. So, you know, the 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 contribution levels that may be higher for an ESOP aren't always appreciated. So I think there's a real challenge to educate employees and help them understand uh, the benefits of ESOP ownership. Mm -hmm. Great. Good, great answer. Um, and I think it points to the, to the fact that um, as, as an ESOP company looks at the um, repurchase obligation, it really is a top management issue. It's not only a financial issue. Of course, it's, it, it has a big impact on, on the finances of the company, but, it's, but um, the entire strategy needs to be taken into consideration. All right. Um, I think I will unmute everyone here. The conference has been unmuted. So we, are, we have a small enough group that if anybody has a question or a comment for Judy, just uh, fire away. Hey Judy, this is Robin from Palmer Donovan. You know, we, we haven't been doing our repurchase obligations very long, but I, I noticed you said something in your presentation that you want to have some consistency in your methodology, like for instance using the valuation, um, you know, how you provide projections to the valuation company, you want the same in the model. Um, in our repurchase study, we're currently 
uh, modeling a little bit different strategy than we're actually doing when it comes to the distributions. Last year we did, we redeemed all of our shares, but in our model we're only redeeming some shares and we were circulating others. Is that really a problem or, um, you know, our goal I think with redeeming shares now is that we recontribute them later um, in the plan, but we haven't modeled it that way. We've modeled sort of a balance between redeeming and recontributing. Well, the, you know, it depends what the purpose of the study is. Um, you know, it, it, the, the goal of a repurchase study is typically to provide information about what future repurchase obligations will be and also to uh, analyze the implications of alternative strategies. So if you're modeling something that isn't consistent with what you're actually planning to do, then the results that you're getting may not reflect how things are going to look. So it might be desirable to have conformity there. Okay. Okay. I, I kind of think we did it because it was just easier for us to get our hands around the first couple times we did it, but as we get more sophisticated with the tool, we may be able to get it closer to, you know, what, what we'll probably end up doing. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Well, Judy, that appears to be it. Any final comments? Um, I want to thank everybody for participating today. Uh, I hope that you found this um, approach uh, useful and informative. And, um, and if you would like a copy of this slide. Jay, how will we handle slides? Um, uh, yeah, if anyone would like a copy of the slides, uh, you will all be receiving a feedback email immediately following this. Just indicate on that uh, uh, feedback that you would like a copy of the slides uh, or just email me and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that you get them. Okay? Now I also want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact Judy. You see her contact information uh, on the screen or uh, contact us here at the OEOC for further information on the, on the topic. Again, we're going to archive this session for future viewing and listening, so please see our website for access to those webinars. Also, I just want to mention some future events that we have in this series of webinars. On March 29th, uh, Kathy Ivancy will be talking about uh, ESOP communications. On April 5th, we're, we will dive into ESOP benefit distributions, which kind of relates to some of the things we're talking about here today with uh, Pete Schuler of Crow Harwath. And on April 10th, we'll talk about valuation with uh, Scott Miller. So those will be very informative. And also, please don't forget our annual conference, uh, our 26th annual conference in Fairlawn, Ohio on April 20th. All of the information for those events uh, is available through our website. So with that, thank you very much, and we will end the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.